Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, and welcome to the live stream of a quarter with the local body candidates for the 2022 or Portuguese local body elections. My name is Ivor Jones, and my family and I have been residents of Portuguese, New Zealand, since we moved here from Rotorua in 2011. As a resident that will be voting in this year's election on the 8th of October 2022, I was interested in asking the mayoral and council candidates to have a quarter with me about who they are and why they have applied for the positions they have. I work in the digital media field and the intention of this cast is to raise the awareness of the Apotiki community in terms of the characteristics and qualities of those people seeking to serve the community. I have spoken directly to several candidates about this idea and a number are supportive, including our first guest, Lynn Restra. All candidates receive the same questions upon which our corridor is based, which should be around 15 to 30 minutes in length, and I hope that you find it of value. With that said, I would like to welcome Lynn Restra. Full disclosure, Lynn and I have worked together. I've done some documentary work with Lynn for the Apotiki District Council. Tell us about yourself, Lynn. Well, um, this I'm just finishing nine years of being on council. Mm. Um, so I was first voted in, in the Waitahi Waweka Otara Award back in 2013. Um, and I had thought for some years that I wanted to stand for council because it just looked um, very pay, pale male stale um, to me at the time. Um, we had one Māori representative and one woman representative at that time. Um, got in on the first uh, time in 2013 uh, so I was councillor um, well just a, the first three years such a such a large learning curve really um, and then in re, re stood in 2016 um, and got back on um, and then the mayor at the time uh, John Forbes asked me to be deputy mayor um which again was another step up mm -hmm. and i um i i kind of shadowed him um through several of the um committees and higher meeting um levels where the mayor goes on behalf of the community rather than necessarily the councillors go. So um, there's there's a lot of work in the mayoral space, which is not done at councillor space. Um, and it's normally that advocating for your community in the regional level, in the zone level, and at a rural and provincial. So that there's these other layers of local government that we have to be a part of. And mm. when you move into that mural space, then you're there all the time um, advocating on behalf of your community in those areas and also with central government and ministers. So 2019, standing for mayor for the first time. Again, you end up kind of going back into putting on your training wheels. Mm. Um, I hadn't realized it would be such a big step up, even from deputy mayor to mayor. There's just so much more to learn and to be a part of, I think. In 2022, what do you think the biggest challenge is for the community of Apotiki? We're looking at your bio here, which is from the Apotiki District Council website, and all of the candidates uh, were required to submit one in this format. Some candidates have declared themselves as independent or have an affiliation. Do you have any affiliation with any particular group or no? I'm, I, I, I would class myself as an independent. And mm. um, I think uh, the interesting thing is I see the, the role as mayor and councillors as one of governance, mm. as opposed to being a political, a political voice. My thinking is that we're here working on behalf of our community. Yes. I'm not, I'm not following party politics or anything like that. Can, can you describe to me the difference between governance and management? Because there has been some corridor out in the Portuguese oh. community that 
that you know the the tail wags the dog oh and, gosh and what um, what does that mean i, yes. I assume that it means and that, that is that is so annoying to hear that and, and it's quite interesting that the same conversation has come up over in uh Whakatani. Oh, okay and um and i'm sorry i don't have it to hand but um um nandor uh, wrote an amazing um article in the a beacon in answer to this um and uh, you know i i i find it i find that quite a difficult um concept because n nothing nothing happens in council unless a strategic decision is made at the council table and there are only seven people in our council table who make those decisions we are guided by information that is gathered for us um we are guided by all of the uh rules regulations and legislations and policy statements etc that that um are above us and um ensure that we stay within um you know central government's guidelines for um, making the decisions that we are allowed to make on behalf of our community so um i i get very annoyed about about that type of uh, comment because it's it's actually impossible and uh, to, to actually do that, there's seven people making decisions around the table. And we, we don't always agree. But th this is what democracy is about. If the majority decision is to do something or not do something or to move in a certain direction, then the majority decision must stand. And, it, and it's up to um, all of us councillors whether we have voted yes or no that we uphold the decision that is made at that table. Management are there to put into action the strategic plans that we we work towards on behalf of our community. So in your uh, experience, Lynn, in governance, have you ever felt the tail was wagging the dog? <laughs> no, it can't. It can't and the other thing be... too is, is so that, there is no uh, evidence there is no evidence to back up that statement is what i'm saying and where it came from who no, knows it, it is no. out there uh, well that's because people speak from a place of not understanding how the how how our our job is first of all what we're there to do and we're not actually there to manage. We are there to, to be the strategic thinkers and the decision makers on behalf of who have, have, have elected us there too. And the other thing too is that when we're there, we then agree to be the voice for our entire district and community. Um, so that's, that's really important. The other thing that... Um, we, we are guided by our, our um, code of conduct and our conflict of interest documents. There, there's a lot put into our training as counsellors around these issues. Mm -hmm. And and if, if a counsellor ever says that they um, think that the tail is wagging the dog, then they don't understand their job. They don't understand their role. Mm -hmm. And... Again, this, this thing about there always being seven of us at the table making our decisions for the betterment of our total district, all of our communities. And, you know, sometimes that's a win-win and sometimes it doesn't feel like a win-win for some parts of our community, but the decisions are made with that in mind and also for our future generations. So what's a, a goal that you have in mind to achieve by the end of this term, Lynn, given that should you become mayor of a Portuguese, what's one of your biggest well, goals? Well, actually, that, that's quite quite interesting. I, I found that a, a difficult um, question to get my head around because um, because we are planning so much in advance, hmm. um, what, what one of my jobs is, is to ensure that we carry out our annual plan that all of us have decided on each year and that we are moving towards our 10-year plan 
and that we are strategically um, re-looking at our uh, long-term plan every three-year cycle. We also have a 30-year infrastructure plan and all of those things are the things that we have um, to, pr to put our thinking into. So at the end of just three years, Iva, the one piece of that job that I have to have done to the best of my ability is actually ensure that our annual plans have taken place. Um, but a, but a topic or an issue, I, I actually think um, most of it is ongoing. Um, we're, we're planning for, you know, year five, year seven, certain things are going to happen. Um, and what are we needing to think about? Um, and so the, the constructions of certain um, pieces of work like our Harbour Master Plan and our Central Business District Plan, um, those are the those are the very special aspirational guidelines that we're putting forward for um, following, but they may take years to to fully eventuate. Yeah, and you refer to that as well in your biography that's on the Portuguese District Council website. I really encourage people to uh, have a go and have a look in the all of the nominations are here. Uh, the process is outlined quite clearly. Uh, it does take a bit of reading to get involved yes. and, and, and go through. There, there's lots to look at and you're going, oh, geez. But uh, it, it really is uh, worth looking at. And the first place that I started, it was this pre-election report, which was prepared in 2022, exactly for this, for this um, event that we're having here. So. I'd encourage anyone to, everyone to go and have a look. Sorry, Lynn, were you going to say something? No, no, no. I, I just um, think that's a really um, neat um, summary of, of who we are, what we're doing, where we're at, and what our what our what our job is. Mm. Yeah. What do you think the role of local government is in shaping the future and success of our community of Port? Oh, huge. And um, it's actually one of the uh, reforms, well, no, it's not a reform. This is a review that actually local government itself, um, local government NZ asked on behalf of all of the councils. Mm -hmm. And what we were saying to central government over these last couple of years is, um, if you're going to be um, bringing in so many changes and so many reforms all at once, and the list just gets longer and longer, mm -hmm. um, really we ought to be reviewing local government and what that might need to be looking like moving into our our future and um so that that review is uh, is being underway and ongoing at the moment and we'll um finish up next year with um final report being put through to central government so um i there's a couple of things that i'm really concerned about as as uh, being part of local government is that I feel central government are beginning to take away the local from local government. And a lot of the reforms that they are trying to move through are moving away the local decision making and either regionalizing or even centralizing it. And then as soon as you start putting um, what is ours to look after into bigger regional areas or uh, even a centralised one shape, um, then where is our voice? And uh, that this is a this is a real concern to me. Um, I I think there are concentration for local government on the four well beings is actually a really important part of helping us in our strategic thinking. And there's probably more than a, that a lot of uh, councils in general could be doing around ensuring the balance of those are covered. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that we need to be doing over these next three years is ensuring that the balance of our well-beings are covered in our strategic thinking. 
For instance, there's been a huge amount done over the last few years and a lot of planning uh, and a lot of aspirational thinking um, on trying to help our economic development. But alongside that economic development, the council has also been looking at our social well-being and our cultural well-being. Um, these play an important part of ensuring that we get the best out of all of the um, um, new projects that are taking part in, in, in the Portiki or already, you know. We, we're in a phase of doing, finishing off a lot of projects, getting a lot of things done that we'd actually been planning for for many years. And, and an interesting thing is that when a new council gets together, if there are new people on that council, they are actually putting in, they are helping put into action plans that have been made over the three years before them or the even longer before them. And so they have to take that on board that they are not specifically their plans, but from then on, when they are around the table, they are trying to work to enable much, much, um, a, a much of those plans as possible, and move move into our strategic thinking space uh, again to ensure that whatever we're doing is for the best of everybody. You refer to the new potential new councillors around the table. So, given mm. Maybe your second term is mayor. What what do you see as your most important attribute that you see as an asset or contribution to that council table? Given there might be new councillors there, there might be old ones. What, what do you think is your most important attributes that you can contribute? I think integrity. Um, I can't go past that. Um, I live my life on. Um, high levels of um, integrity and strong moral um, beliefs and I think that the importance of that uh, within the the mayoral role is really important um, and I have other skills and attributes to help, but I would I would place that as number one. Okay. What are your thoughts around the role of um, your lead role in the community through challenging times such as natural disasters? How would you deal with that if we had a natural disaster like a tsunami mm. or an earthquake? Well, yes, yes. Well, we've, how do you we've already that? we've already had one of those, haven't we? Yeah. We are. Um, so again, the, the mayoral role is, is uh, quite um, specifically set out uh, in what we are supposed to do on, on behalf of our community. Uh, we, we are the, the, the face and the spokesperson for our community to the rest of New Zealand. However, civil defence um, shape around us the expertise and the... Um, the media and the uh, voices and the actions that need to occur depending on what the disaster is all about. Um, so, you know, your, your, your pre-planning is already in place and depending on the um, disaster, uh, my role as mayor is, is to lead, um, be the voice, and to ensure that all of the right people are doing what they're supposed to do at the right time. And then the last part, so whatever the natural disaster is, the last part is also ensuring that the, there is a recovery mode and um, we move through those phases of um, pre-planning an actual event. My role is this, this and this. Um, and then moving into hopefully recovery and that's the long the long term part of of a natural disaster um, we also if our neighbors are in in a place of strife we also help out there one by being supportive of the mayor 
Um, and two, from within our civil defence, we often offer um, uh, s staff to go and help and to uh, give relief in, in, in an at time that, for instance, in flooding, when it's a can be five, seven, ten days, um, even in other disasters, um, our staff also are able to be um, moved into other areas to help. But, so, but but you know my my role is is quite um, it, it's it's just it's it's there to be. Um, I am the mayor. I am the face of of this district. I am the one who should be giving the messages to the district. Um, but I am also supported by really knowledgeable people who are there to help ensure that we make it as smooth as possible. So I'm hearing you say you have a clear defined role as mayor and that you as mayor in the last three years have had to experience those natural disasters. I'm guessing it was the tsunami that you might be referring to? or Yes, that that was probably the uh, um, for, for us um, the only only one that we have had to be actively engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, and, so you got you the know, phone call at 2 a.m. in the morning, did you? Well, we got the earthquake at uh, two, half past two in the morning. No, actually, but it was at half past eight when we we got the tsunami, um, and and the warning that we needed to clear. And out so you you town. as mayor, you as mayor got the phone call from someone to say, hey, um, we all got we, we all got the, no, we got all got the same sound on our our phones, oh. and and of course, um, and then we follow through on on what we've been told to do, um, and the 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 thrilling thing for me about that was how amazing our community is in a, t in a time like that. The, 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 the town was almost completely um, evacuated in about 45 minutes, which included um, two rest homes. And, um, and the little settlements down the coast also, they all had to move to higher ground. Um, and then we had to kind of hang around and wait. I, and of course, I was in town at the time. I had to move out. I took one of the managers who was um, an interim manager. I brought him with me up to my place because it was on higher ground. And once he realized that the civil defense people had moved to the golf club, um, he went down and joined them there so he could be of use there. Um, I had something like 14 radio interviews in the space of two hours. And then I thought, gosh, you know, it's getting hotter and hotter. Um, we hadn't had an all clear. And I thought that a lot of people around where I live might be now hanging out for water. So I filled up two or three water containers and went off and checked in with um, quite a few of the people who were parked up on um, Hospital Hill. And there I met, um, you know, commercial people from out of town, um, holiday makers, um, a lot of locals. And of course, a lot of locals, they've kind of almost all, already worked out where they're going to be. And I'd, I'd ensured that with, with my family, I'd ask my sister-in-law who lives down in the town and my mum, who's just at the bottom of Hokitaia, to come further up the hill. And... Um, I think that was that was neat for uh, our whole district because we, without there being an actual natural disaster, we were able to have such a thoroughly good practice and then ensure our plans moving forward for the next time are even better. Speaking of plans, what are your plans to connect with all parts of the community to ensure that their voices are heard? Uh, um, just to keep doing what I do, and that's having lots of conversations with lots of people wherever I am around the district. And I think um, part of the part of the role of mayor is uh, you're invited to many different types of community events. Um, luckily, lots of them are celebrations, but when you're you're there specifically for a certain celebration you are there with a certain community of people. And that's often my opportunity to have good conversations, not just about what's been celebrated, but what 
what the role is of this particular group, um, what their thoughts are for the future and so on. Mm. I also spend quite a bit of time visiting people during this campaigning time. I go door to door. I'm not very good on Facebook. Um, and I knock on doors and I have conversations and I'm, I, I have been trying to talk up the, the need for everybody to vote um, and go through uh, their choices for their votes that they have. Um, so that's been my emphasis at the moment, but almost everybody wants to ask me about one specific um, topic or, or issue that they have or want to know more about, or they mention something that they would like to see um, some action on. And I so in your yeah yeah so in your, in your canvassing of the local in your canvassing of the local community, yep. what's been the top issue? Yeah, off the top of um, Actually, I have to say three waters. The the community's concern about the four entities model that um, central government are mandating on us at local government level that would be the first the biggest one that has come to the to the fore um and i i'm a i'm a little dismayed when people say what is my um personal opinion on it because it kind of means that people aren't hearing that our our the seven of us at the council table at the moment are unanimously against the four entities model because it does not bring anything of extra added value or less cost or even holding the cost down for us that we can see. And we've done a lot of work around understanding its implications. So that, that has been the one that has been mentioned the most. I guess it's interesting, drawing on my own experience, I've worked for the government and depending which government it is, uh, the flavour of your organisation can move around. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting the process and the debate that's been going on around Three Waters in particular. And it's similar to uh, how polytechnics or institutes of technology have all been amalgamated into one organisation. That's which right. Which is trying to sort itself out, as we've seen in the media, especially mm. from a financial perspective. Uh, so there are those sort of seasons that happen depending yes. on which government yes. is in, in place that's yes. the tension Absolutely. between local and, and yes and, and national. yes totally there is and um we're seeing quite a lot of that at the moment and economies it's around an important scale, resource just, of water yes economies of scale just from an economic point of view the, you know this is what they talk about with this um scottish model um, for the three waters, but um, but I also know that um, linking all of the um, politics together was, you know, because because um, they are losing money, and of course um, COVID hasn't helped because a lot of the universities and politics have lost all of the um, international students, so a lot of the revenue that these um, institutions have um, is no longer there. But making something just into one big thing, or in this case with Three Waters, four big things, the entities, um, doesn't make it right. And, um, and I, I just, I'll go, I'll say one more thing about the Three Waters. The thing that upsets me the most is that the government has promised, um, you know, there's a better off funding that's been offered to all of the councils around New Zealand of something like um, um, $2 billion worth. Um, and the first $500 million is tax funded money. So we, you know, we all contribute to that. The rest of it, after the four entities comes in, has to be borrowed against the entities. So they get, they get all of our assets together and then they're going to, um, borrow a whole lot of money and the first amount of money that's coming out of that is to pay the rest of this better off funding so guess who has to pay all of that back that's us ratepayers 
having to pay for money before we've even going to see any improvement in our water. So we're having to pay back for assets we already own. And in our case, in Oporiki, are not in a bad way. Hmm. So so my, my thinking, I just can't get my head around that. The mysteries of accounting, Lynn. The mysteries of accounting. <laughs> yeah. Elected me- members must act in the best interests of their community and declare any interests that could be perceived as a conflict to being ah, impartial. Yes. Do you yep. have any interests that could be perceived as a conflict of being impartial? Um, gosh, that kind of depends on the topic. I mean, you know, I I was on Oporiki College Board of Trustees, and I've no. just finished my three years there mm-hmm. and, and um, have stepped down from that. Um, so, you know, and I'll use that as an example. Should something have come up where the um, where the council were discussing a report or a an issue or a topic where um, they might be, it's, it's, it's an unusual example, but it's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I would not be able to take part in that discussion because of, of being on the board of trustees for the Apotiki College. Especially do you have any money, you know? Do you have any business holdings, Lynn, that you need to do? Oh, um, well, personally, no, I don't. But but the thing is, Ivo, um, we all have to declare those interests. We have a register, and that is maintained uh, twice yearly, and mm-hmm. And uh, those interests are for ourselves, our our immediate partners, and our parents are often taken into consideration as well. So, um, and then that register is actually uh, kept updated, and and at times we ourselves have to consider should we be at the discussion table on a certain topic. If we have a conflict of interest, hmm. and it's just not a financial conflict of interest, it's actually a conflict of interest in perception. And I think in a small district, that one of perception is the most important one. There is, there's again, there's parameters around the the money side of things. You know, if if your business, if you have um, a certain percentage it's okay. If you are above that, it's not okay. And all of those things we have to work through um, um, the Auditor General's office if we think we are going to have difficulties making decisions. But it's actually up to each of the councillors to know when they're in conflict. We've had to remind people about their uh, interests and also the perception of conflict of interest. But, you know, uh, going back some years, not this particular council, but the uh, six years previously, um, at the time when the Harbour project was going through a lot of its final planning and preparations, um, there were only at one at certain stages there were only four out of the seven who could be present at the table making a financial decision on behalf of the community around the harbour because the others were in conflict of interest. And and again, we had sought advice. So that so that's the thing that we, we do we, and we have to do regularly is make sure that register is, is up to date. And I mean, it takes quite a while for certain things to drop off. Um, so if you're no longer part of a, a directorship, for instance, you know that that takes a while to come away off off the lists because it has to go through all the proper procedures of the registers for companies or directorships and um, it's it's not it's not oh I'm on this I'm off it, it doesn't quite work that well that quickly um, but um, yes it again knowing what could possibly be a conflict of interest and sometimes we get caught out because. You know, we get our agenda and think, oh, actually, um, I, I do have a conflict there. And and the fact that we um, say during an, um, a council meeting, um, I have a conflict of interest with item number seven 
because such and such, then that's noted. And and then depending on what the decision is about, we'll always determine whether or not that per, the, that counsellor or myself um, will take part in the discussions or a, a decision-making part. Thank you for describing the process because I'm a trustee on a number of Māori land trusts in Rotorua. Ah. And the process that you've described is exactly the process we go through when we're, whenever we're managing something mm. like that. So. Mm. We also have to take into account that all of us are members of a... We all live in a community and there's lots of us mm. in lots of things. Mm. Um, but, it's, but it's about having the balance mm. and understanding when, when our decision could be called into question, should we not abide by... Um, the, the the rules and regulations around that. Yeah, maybe the term conflict of interest, you know, uh, maybe just just that perception of, ooh, uh, it's a conflict that I have to declare, rather than just, okay, yeah, I've got an interest in this particular thing that we're considering at a council level, I need to declare that and step out of the decision-making process. Yes, yeah. It, yeah. In most cases, it is quite clear and in other cases, and this is where you you, you need a, um, a really good CE who can understand that they need to bring that to our attention and possibly seek that extra advice. Ah, yes. So we're in the process of that at the moment. And as I'm hoping everybody understands, we have an interim interim CE at the moment. Uh, and But just because of the timing of um, the election and so on, Um, What we're doing at the moment is we have advertised the position for the new CE and we have we have looked at the long list and we will be short coming to a point where we'll create a short list and and then we're and then we're stopping that process because um, it needs to be the decision of the new new council, council, mayor and council um, in the new triennium. Thankfully, our, our interim miles is available at the moment until the end of December. One of their big first big jobs is um, going through the, the shortlist and um, deciding who's going to be the new CE. Are we going to be very hard-pressed to find um, somebody of the calibre of Aileen? Um, however, she came into the position... Uh, and what we've seen over the last six years is her at her um, absolute best because she's like anybody coming into a position in a smaller council, you're normally stepping up into a new role. And um, I would imagine that most of the people who would be looking to come into the CE role here will be the same. So they're starting a new role. Uh, you know, again, got the training wheels on for a bit and then you, you get up to speed. And we've had uh, um, an amazing CE who has given um, a huge amount of time and effort and incredible thinking into what Opotiki can achieve well above. Because we, we are very much admired as a small rural council um, and I'm quite proud to be able to, to say this to, to our community. We are very much admired as a small rural community for being able to achieve what we have achieved um, with the limits of having a very small rate payers paying base. Um, you know, a huge district, not very many rate payers. That makes it hard. And we've always had to think cleverly Um, you know, lean machine um, and ensure that we're focused on the the right priorities, which often in our case is getting the infrastructure right. Mm -hmm. But also Aileen was brought into this position to get the harbour project across the line, uh, which was probably the biggest ask of any CE in a small rural is to, to go to that to the um, to that length for a huge project, which is just going to be, you know, uh, 
a changer, a game changer, and it already is a game changer in our entire district. The, the ramifications of what we have achieved um, and finally need to get it funded and it's been built and it's not far off going to be opened. All of that and all of the things that are rolling along behind it, those have been very thoughtfully planned for and um, moved through with, with the um, council making the decisions and, and the CE implementing all of those decisions. I'm looking forward to the end of 2023 when the harbour will be open. Mm, yes, yes. Um, yes, I know we don't sort of have any um, uh, proper time. Our actual original plan line is not all partway through 2024, but I know that the actual building um, is ahead of schedule. So um, I don't... We, th- those discussions haven't been made as to when it'll be open, but the the, the actual use of the harbour walls will probably be open and being able to be used before we've actually officially opened the whole project. And that's a big, big thing to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time, Lynn. I've re- Thanks, I've I really think. enjoyed this, this discussion. I hope you found it of value. Hmm. Uh, yeah, some yeah. some tricky questions. Just good. Well, well, I think you answered it appropriately. So thank you very much for taking part in this. And this is uh, this will go up to our YouTube channel. And the um, aspiration is to have uh, these videos of the fifteen candidates put up to the channel, so that members of the community can praise themselves of who our candidates are, and so that yep. they can make an informed decision. I hope you found this of value. And, uh, oh yes. Can I make one little plea? Certainly. We in our last election, we managed to have fifty-four percent of our voters vote, and we were one of the highest in New Zealand. Because forty percent was the average, correct? Yes, nationwide. Nationwide, we were fifty-four yes. percent. And even in the last election, the voting percentage down the coast move from 24% up to 42%, mm. which I thought was just fantastic. Um, what, what I'm asking of everybody is that, um, again, this is a time of change. We need everybody to um, make thoughtful decisions about who they're wanting to have around that table, making their decisions on the, you know our decisions for our community um, let's try and get higher than our 54 percent and I'd love it I'd love it if we could get you know really get up there and be one of the top districts uh, voting districts in New Zealand and we could do that um, voting papers come out on September the 15th uh, and then we've got three weeks as you said October the 8th before the decisions come the final results come out. It was re- really cool at the speed dating event on Friday that you attended and, and I attended to see the large group of young people from Oporti. Oh, yes. Yes, our future involved. leaders group. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hey, thanks, cool. Lynn. All right. Namahi.